Uh, welcome everyone, and thanks for joining us today. I am glad to welcome Stepan, who is an associate professor at Radboud University in the Netherlands. Uh, his research interests are security and crypto, machine learning, and uh, evolutionary computation. Uh, he has given more than 20 invited talks at conferences and summer schools, and he's also the author of uh, more than 100 referred papers. Today, he will talk about deep learning techniques in the context of side channel analysis, including also some critical open questions and research directions for the future. Uh, before starting, I would like just uh, to remember that we have a Q&A chat where you can write your questions for Stepan and uh, he will try to answer them uh, during the presentation. So without uh, further ado, uh, please Stepan, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the invitation and yeah, thanks everyone for joining. So let me share my screen. Good. So now you should see my screen. And like Santos already said, the topic today is deep learning for side channel analysis. Uh, in a way, this is a talk, or at least parts of the talk uh, that I give rather often, but I still try to give a couple of new perspectives, a couple of new interesting results that will hopefully um, interest you and motivate you to do research in deep learning and, and side channel analysis. So the, the outline of the talk is, first, I will talk very briefly about side channel attacks and machine learning in general. And then I will discuss several applications, relatively recent applications that we are working that we consider to be very interesting, very important ones. And then I will just uh, briefly discuss the framework we are, we are also developing or we kind of developed to do deep learning side channel analysis. And then I will finish with challenges that I consider the domain has, that are the opportunities for us to, to do quality research. And finally, a brief conclusions to, to just wrap up the work. So where are we when we talk about side channel attacks? Well, when we talk about side channel attacks, we talk about a type of implementation attacks. And what is implementation attack? Is an attack that does not aim at the weakness of the algorithm, but at the weakness of the implementation. And such channel attacks are passive, non-invasive attacks. This basically means that the attacker observes, listens to some kind of signal, but does not interfere or changes the signal. And today, such channel attacks represent one of the most powerful category of attacks on cryptographic devices. But it's even more than that. It's more than just cryptographic devices. Uh, it's also becoming more and more relevant in doing the reverse engineering, um, attacking systems that do not have cryptographic uh, algorithms implemented maybe, but have some secret information. And we use then side channel regardless what type of side channel to obtain that secret information. And how do we commonly divide side channel attacks? Well, we commonly divide side channel attacks into two categories, into direct attacks and two-stage attacks or profiling attacks. And direct attacks are those attacks like uh, simple analysis or differential analysis and so on. While the profiling attacks are today what we consider the most powerful type of side channel attacks. And it's the topic of the today talk because deep learning based side channel analysis is profiling side channel attack. What does it mean? Well, already from the other name, two stage attacks, uh, we get a lot of information. It's an attack that happens in two stages. First stage, profiling stage. In that stage, the adversary estimates leakage models for the targeted intermediates and then uh, exploits those to extract secret information from, from the actual attack phase. So we have profiling phase, we have attack phase. Of course, uh, profiling attacks, two-stage attacks are more complicated than those direct attacks because you as the attacker or evaluator need to have the copy of a device you wanna attack. But if you have 
the copy of a device. And if you build a good model, good template if in the, uh, in the uh, jargon of template attack, then you have hopes that you, the performance of your attack will be much, much better than the performance of direct attacks. And already from this description, profiling phase, attack phase, we can see a lot of similarities with supervised machine learning, where we also operate in two phases, commonly known as training phase and test phase. As such, people used, started using machine learning, after that started using deep learning. And today we can conclude that deep learning techniques represent extremely powerful option for profiling side channel attacks. So how does it look like? Well, here I depict a couple of different general scenarios we can envision when we are doing profiling attacks, in this case, let's say deep learning. The first uh, figure all the way to the left shows basically the setup that we are most accustomed to see in most of the research works where we actually cheat in a bit, uh, in, in the sense that we do not have two devices, that we do not have profiling device and device under attack, but we actually have only a single device. And then we artificially divide measurements from that device into measurements that we say, well, these measurements are for profiling and those measurements are for attack. And from one side, this sounds a bit problematic and it is problematic because uh, those measurements since they come from the same device, they are more similar. So in a way, uh, it's easier for the attacker to do the attack. But also you can look uh, at this from the different perspective and say, well, you give the best possible conditions for the attacker. And then if the attacker cannot break the target even in this setup where everything is from the same device, hopefully when you go for different devices, the attack will be even worse. The setup with two devices is depicted in the first two pictures. So we have device A and device B, and then on one device we do profiling, and then we use the model from one device to attack the other device. This is also commonly known as portability. And it's, it can be also more than just devices. For instance, if you consider the EM analysis, uh, you can come to a portability effect if the, the angle of your EM probe changes between one set of measurements and the second set of measurements. It's still a kind of portability. It's not two different devices, but because of different position of a probe, the effect is there. And finally, we have the third uh, currently used setup or threat model where we can call it non-profiling threat model. And this is a model that is the least um, explored up to now. Basically, there is the paper by Benjamin Timon from 2018 and very little work after it. This is in a way non-profiling side channel attack, but from the deep learning perspective, it is supervised deep learning. Um, the main issue or difficulty with this kind of attack is the complexity because you need to train for AS where the attack was done, 256 neural networks. But those three setups, let's say, represent what we are doing today with deep learning for side channel analysis. So how did we came to this? Well, we started with profiling attacks. And of course, the first profiling attack is the template attack done in uh, 2002. And then there were stochastic models, 2005, and then efficient template attack, and so on and so on. But somewhere around 2010, we also started using various machine learning techniques. And with those techniques, we actually saw that the results are quite good. Why? Well, because the assumptions are less strict than for template attack, for instance. And then if you need to assume less, then in many realistic setups, you will actually get a better performance. But at, at that time, I would say 10 years ago, something like that, we also used machine learning for more than just uh, doing the side channel attack. We also used machine learning to do pre-processing. We also used machine learning to do feature engineering, for instance, because all those 
techniques are relatively expensive. So we always wanted to find, let's say, a relatively small number of uh, features that are the most discriminative that will give us the best performance. So all those tasks and many others, people did with machine learning. And then somewhere five years ago, 2016, uh, it, we started using uh, deep learning. Why I uh, write a question mark? Because it is a little bit not trivial to actually understand when we did actually start with deep learning. So what we know for sure is that 2016, we started with convolutional neural networks. But deep learning can also be, for instance, multi-layer perceptrons. And multi-layer perceptrons are used somewhere from 2010. The issue is many of those beginning works did not clearly write what's the number of hidden layers. And then we say, if there is more than one hidden layer, we consider it already a deep learning. If it's one hidden layer, we do not consider it deep learning. But since many of the papers did not write the number of hidden layers, it's actually not so trivial to understand, is it deep learning or it's not? But let's see, we are working in deep learning setup from 2016, last five years. And you can see it is also very strong turn of the opinion of the community. So up to 2016, people used support vector machines, multi-layer perceptrons, smaller ones, random forest, many, many different techniques, but all those were machine learning. Then from 2016, the attention of the community basically completely changed and we all moved towards deep learning, where now finding machine learning papers becomes very difficult. And what, what is even more, the number of papers um, that we, oh, let me go immediately to this slide, just to uh, display the number of papers using deep learning for side channel analysis grows significantly. So here you can see a graph uh, we recently made. So in blue are data sets that you can also get a feeling at one point in time, the community, someone from the community provided a data set that is today publicly available. And then in black, you can see the papers. I must note the papers for 2021 are done, uh, considered only up to July. So it's not that we have the, the decrease in the number of papers. Actually already we have more than last year papers. I just need to, to do a new statistics, check a bit more papers, but we can see actually there is a lot of papers considering deep learning and side channel analysis. I would even dare to say this topic receives more attention than five or plus years machine learning. So why do we like deep learning? Why didn't we just continue with classical machine learning? Well, there is, I would say several reasons. First, it's simply performance. We noticed that with deep learning, we can reach top attack performance, meaning we can break the target with a small number of attack traces even when the device is protected with countermeasures. And then, you know, there is a number of works already from 2017 showing some hiding countermeasures that can be broken up to today, where we show that it's relatively easy to break something like first order masking with some hiding countermeasure. So that's the first promise of deep learning. It breaks data sets that are even protected, targets that are even protected. Second promise, is something that we often like to say, but we think about it much less, is that it allows us a bit more freedom in what we do. Or to say differently, we do not need necessarily to pre-process or to do feature engineering for the measurements because we wanna plug in the raw traces and we leave it for deep learning to decide to implicitly select those important features. So those would be a couple of main advantages of deep learning. And this is, this is our common deep learning based attack setup. So how does it work? Well, we start with oscilloscope where we do some measurements and from there we obtain raw data. And actually for many of the research works, this is actually the first step because uh, doing the measurements, publishing the data sets is 
still not very popular in the community. So most of the community relies on already published data sets, takes the data and uh, then does the attack. And then first step after you have raw data is doing the pre-processing. But like I said, one of the promises is that you hopefully do not need it. So this step can be omitted. Then the same goes for feature engineering. You select important features or you do not select important features. In deep learning, we prefer not to do it. And then we have algorithm selection and model training, which is already becoming a little bit more complicated, simple, because while we do not consider or in the state of the art today, so many different algorithms, two main algorithms are multi-layer perceptron and convolutional neural network. What we do is we try to do a decent uh, hyperparameter tuning. So finding those hyperparameters that will result in an architecture that will provide us with the best possible attack results. And once we train our model, we do attack evaluation, where there is also the discrepancy be between the metrics, because commonly with most of machine learning, you would evaluate loss, you would ac evaluate accuracy, but unfortunately, loss accuracy will not always map nicely to side channel performance. And then we will go for something like key rank or success rate or guessing entropy to really estimate what is the number of attack traces required to break the target. So that being said, uh, oh, wrong side. Uh, let's let's um, say what did we manage to do up to now with deep learning. Well, first, like I said, it's very successful. It breaks uh, targets even protected. So what we managed to do is we showed on a number of data sets that we can use deep learning and various architectures. So for instance, both MLP and CNNs to, uh, to break various targets. So both symmetrically and publicly. What is again important to note is currently, our deep learning models, so our architectures, are very efficient and relatively small. Why I say very efficient and relatively small? Well, if we would compare it with what is done in other domains, I don't know, like image classification, their state-of-the-art architectures are, I would dare to say, big 20, 30, 40 plus layers while in, in side channel community in profiling uh, deep learning attacks, actually most of the neural networks are relatively small, so up to 10 layers, but even 10 layers sounds like overkill for most of the settings. So you, it's not uncommon to see very successful attack with a neural network that has like two hidden layers. So as small as possible architecture to still call it deep learning. And what is also important to note that it seems, well, at least while we are looking for such a small architectures, that finding such small architectures, such small models is not such a big issue. So people successfully used complicated techniques like genetic algorithms in 2016 paper, the first one using CNN, but they uh, people also successfully used reinforcement learning, Bayesian optimization. So relatively involved techniques to obtain top architectures. And indeed today, state-of-the-art architectures are obtained with those techniques. But even random search, if you allow this a number of random models to be evaluated, and if you put reasonable uh, hyperparameter ranges, actually results in very successful architectures. So let's, let's go into a couple of applications where I will tell you what we are doing uh, more recently. So uh, the first thing I will mention is what we call efficient attacker framework. And in this work, we basically started with the normal premise that the profiling side channel analysis assumes strongest adversary to estimate worst case scenario. And then deep learning shows superior results in practice. And this is very exploratory field. You know, people test, 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 test many different architectures, find one very good or many 
very good performing architectures report the results. But what we commonly omit to say is how does this tuning part, hyperparameter tuning part, actually affects adversary assumption and profiling section analysis. So what is done mostly uh, is that we consider hyperparameter tuning, but we do not consider the effort invested in hyperparameter tuning. And even more, we do not consider at all the number of profiling traces. So indeed, if you look at the papers, you will see commonly that people discuss, well, this is the graph for different number of attack traces, but the number of profiling traces is commonly fixed and it's very arbitrary. One paper uses 20,000, second paper will use 40,000, third paper will use 55,000, not important enough, but the number is very arbitrary. So there is no strong motivation why to use any number for the number of profiling traces. Of course, rudimentary perspective would be use as many as possible or use as many as it is available. But the question is, why would we do that? First of all, it will take us more time. Second, it can result also in the overfitting of a model. So what we wanna do is develop a framework that will de define the minimum power that the attacker requires to conduct a successful attack. So we are trying to limit the attacker in a sense to say, well, yes, you as the attacker can be successful, but what are the assumptions you need to make to be successful, but with minimal power? So this is uh, very connected with, with deep learning, especially because the deep learning adds one more perspective to the analysis. And this is the per uh, perspective of learnability. How difficult it is to find, to learn a model that will efficiently break a target. So this is how commonly the operations happen. So we have our neural network. So there is the number of layers, the number of neurons, filters, activation functions. We have our measurements, profiling set. We have different optimizers, regularizers, numbers of epochs, batch sizes. We have different loss functions. And all this actually gives us a number of hyperparameter tuning experiments. But if we also want to look at the evaluation perspective, for instance, how the evaluation lab evaluates something, you also need to evaluate for the time perspective. How much time was necessary to break the target? And then in breaking the target is obviously you need to account your effort, your time to find the architecture that breaks the target. So this is in essence what we are trying to do. We are commonly in the two-dimensional setup where we have attack traces, profiling traces, and then certain numbers are failed, certain numbers are pass or success. We try actually to go into three-dimensional setup where we discuss attack traces, learnability and profiling traces. And then we basically form a cube and only part of that cube. So a smaller cube is fail and the other parts are pass or vice versa, depending on the difficulty of a data set. Uh, in nutshell, what we do is we define components for the framework. So what are the components? Number of measurements. So that's the quantity component. Then the quality component, the measurements itself. So finding a, ma a mapping F, our, our model that maps between measurements and labels, we need to have sufficiently high SNR, we need to have good leakage model selection. So that's the, on the quality side, which we hopefully assume we are getting correctly. And then we need to do the learnability aspect correctly. So do the hyperparameter tuning. And here you can just see a couple of results for ASCAD data set, two leakage models having weight identity. This is a number of randomly selected models in a reasonable ranges. And what we can see here, so on the x-axis, you have the number of profiling traces. On the y-axis, you have the number of attack traces to reach guessing entropy less than 20. And while we can see, for instance, that with small number of profiling traces, our attack indeed is not uh, very successful if we consider a small number of attack traces, but the differences between using 
80,000 profiling traces or 100,000 profiling traces are very small. For some setups, if we consider more models, there is actually even no difference at all for the best model. What does it tell us? Well, for let's say the naive attacker that would use 100,000 measurements, the attacker would say, I'm successful. But actually we see that the attacker can succeed in the same way by even using smaller number of profiling measurements, which basically limits his power, but he still reaches the correct attack, so obtains the correct uh, secret information. So in a way you can see it's a trade-off. Do we wanna invest more time in having more measurements? Do we wanna invest more time maybe to have a nicer hyperparameter unit? So that was the first uh, setup I wanted to discuss. Second is a project that we are still working and we are quite excited about it. And it connects with the topic we consider to be extremely important for side channel. And this is the topic of explainability, how to understand what a neural network is doing. So we, we struggled and we are struggling in a way in the last two years with different approaches and what we are currently working and we consider to have um, a very nice uh, performance, a very nice results is, this, is the ablation. So what is ablation? It's a process which is actually long used in neuroscience where controlled damages are introduced in neural tissue to investigate the impact of damages on the brain capability to perform specific tasks. So what do we do with ablation in neural networks? Well, we investigate what is the system performance by removing certain components to understand what is the contribution of that component to a system. So trivially think of a neural network and then we start removing randomly certain neurons. We remove, we remove neurons and nothing happens. Well, obviously those neurons were not important for the process. We remove neurons, something happens. Okay, this is the first clue that we now can do better analysis of these neurons and understand why those neurons are important to get the final result. Of course, the ablation, how it's commonly used in, in machine learning is not readily applicable for side channel analysis. So we actually needed to develop a custom side channel analysis methodology for, for ablation. I will not go through the, through the pseudocode uh, algorithm, but it's not difficult. It basically follows the approach. I said now you remove something, you evaluate the effect based on that, you conclude something. What I can briefly uh, show you is just a couple of results. So for instance, here I show you some results when we add Gaussian noise, where you see before, after something happening before ablation and after ablation and L, L1 to L whatever is the layer. So what we actually can see here is that this is 10% uh, is just the, the number of uh, neurons that we ablated. So what we actually can see, for instance, this was the uh, Gaussian noise case. So when, when someone would add Gaussian noise as a countermeasure, as a hiding countermeasure, we could see that neural networks tend to deal with Gaussian noise as soon as possible or at the first layers. So this was somehow telling us, well, if we do a change, we will see the biggest change in the first layers for Gaussian noise. But then if we would move for something like desynchronization, which is uh, not amplitude uh, type of uh, uh, hiding countermeasure, but time type of a countermeasure, we actually notice that neural networks tend to extend the influence and tend to deal with desynchronization also in deeper layers. The same, uh, the same thing we also saw for even more complicated um, countermeasures like jitter, the, the moving where the uh, neural network tries to deal with this, a countermeasure like that happens in even deeper layers. So we could actually realize that different countermeasures are deal, dealt with from the neural network perspective in different layers where actually simpler countermeasures are dealt 
But at the beginning, while more complicated, especially time-based countermeasures are actually dealt with in inner layers, so deeper layers. In this way, we could get a feeling of the explainability because now we can understand what layer plays important role for certain countermeasure. We can also understand even how to improve uh, the performance because based on that, we actually know at what part of a neural network we need to add something, but still what we do not know how to explain is why, why exactly that specific layer is important. What happens inside the layer that makes the processing of a countermeasure resolve? So that would be on the, on the explainability side. Uh, next, I will also mention uh, recent work we did on public key crypto. Why? Because currently public key is much less represented in state of the art deep learning than, than attacks, for instance, on AES. So almost all the papers consider AES, and then there is a little number of papers that go in public key crypto. And in public key crypto, uh, if we talk about real world implementation, then we of course must also consider state of the art countermeasures, which would be based on randomization of the private or ephemeral keys. And then usually you would also have something like for each private key operation, you would have a scalar blinding with uh, randomly generated bits. And then how one would commonly attack it, he, she would use something along the lines of horizontal attack based on a single trace, and even that kind of attack does actually pose a serious threat for protected ECC or RSA implementation. Of course, what is it, is it that happens if, that, if the secret learned through a single trace attack, so horizontal single trace attack, actually contains too many wrong or noisy bits, then the effort you need to do to recover the remaining bits becomes impractical due to time and computational constraints. And then if you attack several single traces, you can actually recover several partially correct random private keys. And then you use that information to label subtraces, so uh, trace intervals uh, representing processing of a single private key bit. And we can use that, for instance, to train a neural network. What's the point? Well, the point is that if our horizontal attack kind of works, but it's far from being successful. So for instance, because we are talking about bits, it's binary classification. So either bit can be zero or one. So 50% guess is random guessing. Everything above 50% it's successful. But of course, if you are around 51, 52%, you are not doing very well. So what happens in those setups where you, you are better than random guessing, but barely better than random guessing. So you can get, which happens in practice often, a little bit more than 50%, let's say 51, 52, 53%. Can we still succeed in the attack? If we would do cryptanalysis, we couldn't because the effort is too large, but we can see actually that with deep learning we can. So we attacked protected ECC implementation in software and what we developed is something we call deep learning iterative framework. How does it work? Well, we take our measurements, we split them into two parts, we train on one part, we predict on the other part, and we relabel the other part. Then we train on the other part, we predict on the first part, and we relabel the first part. We combine and shuffle. That's the iteration one. We repeat this in a number of iterations. Why does this work? Well, as long as you start with more than 50% uh, correct uh, bits from your horizontal attack, your neural network in every iteration will manage to correct, to correctly relabel some of the wrong bits. And with that iterative process, you will relabel in every iteration, a couple of wrong bits and more and more and more and more. And you will repeat this procedure until you reach a successful attack. So how does it really work in practice? So here I show you just a couple of results for a, a data set called SISWAP arithmetic. Uh, and we can see here maximum minimum average. So 
deep learning approach kind of works. You know, you get a little bit better with framework iterations, but not much. But we can also add something like data augmentation. So increase the number of measurements but with synthetic measurements. And then our performance immediately improves. We can add a little bit more regularization with dropout. We can see that the performance improves even more. We can also combine regularization and data augmentation. And you can see that from, from a framework that worked on average slightly better than 50%, so slightly better than random guessing, we get framework that works on average more than 80% accuracy, and in maximum value, it reaches 100%. For a different data set, the results are even more impressive. So you can easily reach average more than 90% and maximum 100%. What does it mean? It means we start with something that is barely above random guess and we reach 100% accuracy. Every bit of the private key is successfully recovered. Finally, uh, application I will mention is feature selection. And now you can immediately say well, feature selection. In the beginning, you said we do not need feature selection with deep learning. And indeed, this is interesting perspective. So I did say one of the advantages of, of using deep learning is that we do not need uh, feature selection. But what happens still in, with most of the, our research works, we, we do feature selection. So the question is, can we obtain even better results if we actually really go into setup and say, well, now we do not do any kind of feature selection, but we leave everything for a neural network. And of course, it must be clear that from the machine learning perspective, working with more features than we currently work is not a problem. If you compare with other domains, our number of features is very small. So, just two commonly used data sets in side channel analysis, ASCAD with fixed key, ASCAD with random keys. So ASCAD with fixed key, there is 100,000 features in every trace. And actually, we commonly use a pre-selected window of 700 features. For ASCAD with random keys, there is 250,000 features in every trace. And we commonly use a pre-selected window of 1,400 features. So it's a huge difference. Why do we use those windows? Well, because the original publications suggested those uh, windows to be good windows to break the target. And this is completely correct. But what happens if we do not use those windows? So we, we defined four general scenarios for side channel analysis feature selection. But this is not a technique. This is just the description. There is something that is we call refined point of interest, where we assume adversary has access to mask shares and it's enough knowledge about the implementation to select points of interest. So really pinpoint those most important ones. Then there is the optimized point of interest, where the adversary has access to random secret shares and implementation knowledge. The main difference from the previous one is that this one will consider the minimum trace interval where the main SNR picks happen. Then we uh, designed what we call semi-optimized point of interest, where we assume that adversary selects a larger interval and guesses the points of interest location inside that uh, complete measure. Interval. And finally, non-optimized point of interest setup, where we assume that the attacker must consider the whole trace interval, but can resample for the sake of efficiency, computational efficiency. So resampling like very simple, you know, combining 10 points into one or something like that. And just to show you various results. So this is for the two data sets, ASCAD with fixed key, ASCAD with uh, random keys, with MLP and CNN, uh, and using Hemingway or identity leakage model, and of there is a lot of details here, a lot of numbers, but what is the main message here is that we can actually break ask at fixed key, ask at variable keys. So two data sets that are commonly used today that are, let's say, benchmarks for the performance with a single attack trace 
even with a very small architecture. So I can tell you this MLP has two uh, hidden layers. This CNN has one pooling uh, uh, layer, one convolution layer. So extremely small neural networks can break with a single attack trace data sets that we consider state of the art to be used today if we actually use more than originally suggested number of features. So this actually tells us that indeed, not only that deep learning does not need we do feature engineering, actually deep learning is better if we do not do feature engineering and we leave it for deep learning to decide what features are important. Uh, I will really go quickly through these uh, three slides. I will just mention that one of the big issues with, with deep learning side channel analysis is there is a lot of papers, there is a lot of developments. It's not easy to follow. It's not easy to implement it. It's not easy to test. It. That's why we recently also tried um, uh, to make a publicly available framework that will allow side channel community efficient and easy usage of, of deep learning for side channel analysis. And we made something called IC framework. And yeah, we kind of consider it to be quite nice. It, it has a lot of functionalities. So it, it also has graphical user interface and reproducibility and so on, so on. And if anyone would be interested, you can obtain the framework from, from the link. I will also share the slides later, or you can also send me mail. So to conclude, what are the challenges we face today? I will uh, divide challenges based on those machine learning process flow phases. When we talk about raw data, the biggest challenges are actually that we consider mostly software implementation with limited countermeasures. This we can easily break with deep learning. So what we need to do is consider hardware implementation, consider higher order protection. So this is to really see what, what are the performance of deep learning. We need to attack something worth attacking. On data pre-processing, people say use data augmentation, don't use data augmentation, use this, don't use that. So what we are still missing is a clear set of guidelines, what pre-processing techniques to use and in what settings. When should I use data augmentation? Always or just sometimes. So things like that, we actually do not know. For feature engineering, the question is, do we need feature engineering? Well, the most recent results that we made kind of suggest, no, we not, it's not that we don't need it. We should avoid it because the performance is much better. But it's still too soon to say in general, you should never do feature engineering. So more clarity on this would be uh, very welcome. On the algorithm selection side, uh, what we commonly do is we use small data sets. So 100,000 measurements, whatever, it's all small. So it's questionable, our small neural networks that we are using today, will it be also insufficient and enough when we start using large, very difficult data sets? So this is, this is interesting perspective. Everything for now, we, we are very successful with one, two, five hidden layers. What happens if we go for millions of traces for a very good protected count, uh, implementation that is hardware based? Can we still break it so efficiently with such a small architecture or then our neural networks will become as large as in other domains? It's very difficult to answer that. Uh, what are the most important hyperparameters? There are so many for convolutional neural networks, for instance. Which one to tune? All of them? Well, then you get a huge number of models to test. How to know which ones are the most important? People also suggest, let's say, relatively new trend, custom elements for uh, side channel analysis and deep learning, like custom loss functions. All this is very nice, but in general, it also increases the number of hyperparameters to test. So again, something we don't yet fully understand what to do. When we talk about attack evaluation, well, we don't still understand completely the relationship between side channel metrics and model learned parameters. We do not understand how any selected hyperparameter will directly make a model fail or succeed. And we do not 
always know how to estimate the attack performance based on machine learning metrics, since the attack performance is in the end assessed with side channel metrics. So what is next? If I would just need to name three big questions, how to do unsupervised deep learning side channel attack, explainability, difficult targets, whatever difficult target means. To conclude, today, in my opinion, deep learning does represent the most powerful option for side channel analysis, at least from the academic perspective. What is important to note is that our state of the art is much simpler than state of the art in other domains. And what we also notice, there is a lot of knowledge transferable from other domains, and we should not be afraid to trans transfer that knowledge. We should not invent something just for the sake of saying, look, this is something completely new. Yes, if we need it, this is a great option. But if other domains, machine learning already developed something to solve a specific challenge, I believe the proper way is actually using what we already know. So not reinventing the wheel. And finally, the big, big question that constantly remains, what do new attacks teach us about the security of device and how to improve the security of the device? I told you, for instance, we broke ASCAT with a single attack trace. Sounds great, but how does this result actually tell us what should we change in that implementation to make ASCAT more secure? Of course, trivially, we would say, more trace, um, higher order countermeasure, hardware implementation, so on and so on. But the, the exactly what to do, this is very difficult and we don't know how to map that knowledge. And with this, uh, thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, I will be very happy to answer. And if you do not have any questions now, uh, you can also contact me on any of my email ad addresses and I will do my best to answer your questions later. Uh, and yeah, are there any questions? Maybe I can also stop sharing. It'll be easier to see. Yeah, I don't okay. see any. I don't see any questions, Stepan. Uh, okay. That either means the talk was good or the talk was bad. <laughs> well, actually there is a, Ooh, I don't, that, yeah. Okay. Uh, how successful are meta heuristics such as genetic algorithms for side channel analysis? Uh, thank you. Uh, that's that's a very good question. Um, I actually do not know. Uh, let me explain. Uh, already the first paper from 2016 by Magrebi et al., the first paper that used convolutional neural networks, in the appendix they write, we use genetic algorithms to do hyperparameter tuning. From that information, one would say, okay, okay, it seems, it seems that it works. Unfortunately, there are no details in the paper to really understand what happened. Uh, what we did, well, this year, almost one year ago, we tried to use evolutionary algorithms, not genetic algorithm, but genetic programming to see, can we evolve custom activation functions for side channel analysis? And the answer is actually yes you can make custom activation functions. But the question is, do we wanna do it? Because um, those are very specific for very specific neural networks for very specific data sets. So you can get something that works better than, I don't know, ReLU, but that will work better than ReLU for that specific setup. So it works, but it's very expensive. Beyond that, uh, there is the whole domain of neuroevolution uh, where you can do neuroevolution uh, type one, neuroevolution type two. So either evolve architectures or evolve architectures and weights. I think this is very unexplored. There is a paper by Fateme Ganji and, and others. They did uh, something along those lines with the system they called Infonet. And they, they show that neuroevolution does help. And I think this is a nice beginning result but it's still questionable because it's also very expensive. I mean, for your evolutionary algorithm to find something, it's very expensive. Does it make sense compared to something simple like random search? If random search works, why to complicate? 
or Bayesian optimization is also very lightweight process. So I think new revolution has a place to be investigated, but it's not investigated enough. Can you elaborate how much time space these attacks need and compare this effort with other state-of-the-art attacks which do not use side channel brute force attacks? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, this, is, this is a very general question that is not very easy to answer because it depends on, on what kind of data set do you uh, attack. But in general, for what is currently done in publicly available data sets, uh, how much space time? Well, if you already have a good model, you are, you are done in, if you have a decent laptop, couple of minutes, hours, I don't know, depending on exactly how many profiling traces you wanna use. If you also wanna find a good architecture, then for instance, we did experiments with Bayesian optimization and it took us, well, after we implemented Bayesian optimization for side channel, of course, but it took us on average five hours to find the best architectures we managed to find. And those architectures today are still somewhere state of the art. So the effort is not great, uh, not very large. Space, yeah, I mean, it's nothing big. Those architectures are very small. The number of trainable parameters, if you wanna talk in that direction is yeah, from 10,000, let's say up to 1 million which is of course quite large range I'm giving you, but very small compared to, I don't know, state of the art uh, uh, G, GT uh, models uh, for, for uh, uh, that has what, 157 million trainable parameters. So ours are very, very small architectures. So the effort, the main effort comes today for deep learning side channel analysis in hyperparameter tuning. Since we see the current state of the art does not require a lot of hyperparameter tuning, it seems we are very efficient. So how do we compare with other state of the art attacks, brute force attacks? I would dare to say we are magnitudes more efficient, but of course it would also depend on what other state of the art attack do you have in mind? I don't know if you consider AES and then best Cryptanalysis would be what biclic attack. So the difference between biclic and 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 side channel is orders and orders and orders of magnitude. So there is no comparison at all. Uh, there is a question by Zahra. I was wondering if adversarial attack can be applied in deep learning model in this area. Um, well, adversarial attack as designed is is made something to confuse neural networks, let's say confuse them. So adversarial attacks could have a role as a, as a countermeasure. Uh, so we do adversarial attacks to, pre to prevent deep learning attacks. Um, the problem there, I think there are two, uh, two problems. First problem is most of those adversarial work mostly in the amplitude domain and dumb domain, so we are rather limited what we can do there. Second, yeah, um, when you are simulating, your simulation will allow everything. You know, you just take the measurements and post hoc you add countermeasure and you're fine. But the question is how to really develop a system that injects adversarial examples while your algorithm is running. This, this sounds much, much more challenging then, then have a countermeasure because one could say already any hiding countermeasure is in a way adversarial example because it makes it uh, more difficult for the machine learning algorithm to succeed. The difference is that when we do Gaussian noise, we do random noise. With adversarial, we would try to find those, those features where it will be the biggest problem for neural network to classify successfully. We can do that. But like I said, it's easy to do post hoc. I actually don't know how to do it uh, on the fly. So post hoc, we did the experiments two years ago. We published a short paper about it, works amazingly. How to do it in practice, I don't know. 
I think uh, you said that GE noise gets de dealt with by early layers. Uh, yeah, GE noise, uh, uh, yes, Gaussian noise. What if the noise was not an overlay, but actually embedded in how the algorithm was running? Okay, so, um, well, I think it does not make a difference. This reason is simple. You have Gaussian noise. The Gaussian noise can be environment because your uh, oscilloscope or whatever is not good or just not perfect enough, or can it be countermeasure? In both uh, setups, this is something that reduces the quality of your measurements, that makes your attack more difficult, because you also need to consider it from different perspectives. Your machine learning algorithm does not know what a countermeasure is. It's just noise. It's not important what is the source of the noise. So if I understand your uh, uh, question correctly, I would say uh, not a problem if it's overlay, it's just how it, how it happens. Still, your, uh, your machine learning algorithm, your deep learning algorithm needs to beat that noise, whatever is the source, to, to do a, a successful attack. Does it answer the question, Vincent? Hopefully. No, I don't see any other question. I think. Okay. Cool. I think we are good. Okay. Thank you then. Uh... Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah so thanks a lot, Stepan. It was a very nice uh, talk. I think it was very interesting. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, yeah.